Hey everybody, it's Tom Terms with the FujiNet Project, and I wanted to make a quick video doing a preview of the CPM functionality that will be available to Apple II FujiNet users. This will allow you to run CPM applications that are stored on the SD card on your FujiNet and use your Apple II as a terminal. There are many advantages to this, namely that uh, the CPM that is running on the FujiNet runs very fast. The ESP32 is a very fast processor and can thus run CPM applications extremely quickly. The second advantage is that you don't have to worry about the unusual disk formats that have had to be used in the past for Apple II CPM usage, which I think will make a lot of people very happy. So in this video, I will go over basically bootstrapping CPM so you can run it and then just kind of do a quick little run through with a few applications and end with a little demonstration of speed by basically doing a build of a, a very large assembler application and running it. To start, we boot our FujiNet and we'll see we come up into config and we'll go to apps. Right now, this is still being worked on. This feature is, requires, absolutely requires that you have the SPI fix done to your uh, FujiNets. If you bought your FujiNets from Masteries, please talk with him on how to apply this fix or have him make this fix for you so you can run this if you wish to run this. We go into needs work because this terminal still is in the early stages of development. And we use the VT100 terminal here. This is a complete, a fairly complete VT100 emulation. Uh, I am always adding in edge cases as I find them. Uh, runs on the Apple II and talks to the CPM device. And I'll make a version of this for modem as well. And of course, being VT100 is 80 columns. We'll go ahead and mount it, read only, and press escape. And just to make this fair, I'm going to run this in one megahertz mode on my 2C plus. And we'll boot. Now the running this in one megahertz versus four megahertz, the only difference is the speed of the terminal. The ESP32 runs at the same speed, regardless of how fast the terminal is read and read or read or written to. So now that we've done that, we find ourselves in run CPM and at our A prompt here, you'll see a little garbage at the top of the screen. And that's literally because I'm still working out bugs with uh, back and forth between smart port and uh, having to use the 80 column card. It's not 100% perfect. Do a directory. And the way that everything is set up in uh, on the SD card, it, there is a folder called CPM. Under that, there are folders A, B, C, D, et cetera, for each drive. And underneath those are the user numbers, 0 through 15, for the 16 possible user areas. This is drive A0, which contains all the needed user, uh, user applications, et cetera. And one of the things about Run CPM is that it is a high-level emulation. BDOS? Uh, BIOS, BDOS, and CCP are all written in C and running on the ESP32. And there is a Z80 emulator, so you can run the actual applications. But the because the CCP is written in, in C, the BDOS, etc., one, it's very fast, and two, we can add features very easily. So one of the things that's part of this particular uh, CCP, for example, is that any files that are in user area zero on drive A, uh, that will be searched if a file that you're asking for isn't in the current directory, such as loading an application. So you can put your commonly used utilities on drive A, user zero, and they'll be available everywhere. So to start, um, I guess we'll just go right to the point here and we will load a copy of. WordStar. That's on drive D here, no problem. And you'll see right here, bam, coming up. 
This is WordStar 3.3 running in the ANSI terminal. Set up VT100. And you'll notice that we have a printer configured. And that actually means that, yes, indeed, you can actually take and print a file. Nope. Uh huh. Sure. Nope. Nope. You can print a, you can print something uh, directly to the printer, and you can go pick it up in the web administration. In fact, let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's see. I will move my things over here so that we can do this. Sure, screen capture. And yep, excuse me for a moment. I move you out of the way. And you can see I'm hard at work doing ANSI here. Uh, let's see. Ooh, Apple Fuji. For my, since I named my device Apple Fuji here, bam. And I have my Epson printer configured here. We'll take and download a printout, grab it. And then we'll see there's our output right there. Fully paginated. So yes, you can print full documents in from WordStar. Works great. So with that, let's go ahead, go back to our video capture. Of course, we can edit documents too. We'll load a document here. And since this is WordStar, you use WordStar convention to move up and down the documents, etc. It works just fine. And so on. Control K Q. We can exit the system here. And even applications like programming environments. Like Turbo Pascal, for example. work just fine. We can go in, we can look at some game source code. Written in Pascal. Boom. Bam, 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 bam. Control KD. We can compile the results. Let's go ahead and just make a compile. Compile. And there we go. Of course, we can run it too. And there's our game. Boom. Move down, move down, move down. Fire. Same. Oop. Oh well. So there we go. Boom. I'm back, but and Turbo Pascal works just fine. Um, you can see that the performance of CPM here is not really bound by the terminal in any way. Even though I'm running here at one megahertz and we haven't really done any optimization of the terminal here, it still runs just fine and is extremely usable. Um, we can go back. Drive A to user five and run do things like run Zork. And that works. And yes, believe it or not, I think this is the wrong terminal and definition being run by this one. We need to take and rerun the terminal definition program. So for any applications, uh, for example, that need to be set up, one of the things that you really need to do is you need to make sure that you're using the correct terminal definition for your program. In this case, it's VT100, straight VT100. We 
We'll use 11 because there's no graphics. Bam. We go ahead, it does the installation. Again, ignore the ats. Again, this is uh, quirks with the terminal that I have to work out because the CPM thread and the smart port thread are running in two separate threads here. Uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it's something I have to work out. But with that, we can go ahead. Now that we've installed MultiPlan, for example, we can run it. There we go. Go ahead and quit, just get out of there. Boom, fine. So I guess at this point, we can basically end with a little demonstration of, well, how fast is uh, this particular processor here? Let's go to drive in, where I have my copy of Big Fourth. And this is a version of, uh, this is the canonical version of 8080 Fig Fourth, version 1.1. It's intended to be compiled with the Digital Research uh, Mac Macro Assembler. And it is approximately, if we actually take a look at it now, let's see, this is a very, very large file. We'll go ahead and control C out of this. If we do a stat on this, We'll see that the assembler file is about 64 kilobytes with the source code, and it produces uh, an 8K binary when it's all said and done. How long does this take to build? Well, on my Coleco Atom, for example, which is a fairly middle of the road uh, Z80 running at 3.58 megahertz, uh, a little bit slower than four megahertz uh, Z80s that you find of the mid 1980s. It takes about 25 minutes to do a full build of uh, Fig Fourth. That is assembling it, getting it to hex, and then the load's really fast. But here we'll do this in roughly about a minute, as we'll see here. We'll start. Uh, I have on drive A. A copy of Mac, so it's just available no matter which drive I'm on. So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, Mac. I'm going to do fourth, and I'm going to say, well, I don't want symbols, and I don't want, uh, I absolutely don't want symbols, and I don't want any printed output. I just want the hex file, and we'll see here that this will take roughly about a minute to complete. And this is very fast. And again, uh, disk access isn't optimized here, but there's plenty of opportunities to make this even faster. We should be coming on up on roughly being done in just a moment. Yep, there we go. There's our 4000 use factor. Bam. Now we have a hex file. There's our loaded hex file. If we go ahead and do our load on that. Records written. We run our fourth. And there is our 8080 fig fourth. So we'll just do a test. Make a word here. Make sure it's working. Do a vlist to see if it's here. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me do that again. Okay. I forgot to put the semicolon. 
we do a vlist here, we'll see our new word up there at the top. And it works. Bam. We can, of course, type by to get back to CPM. Now I'm going to end the, dim the video here with a few small little factoids. Well, actually one in very particular, you might be asking, well, what's the disk format like? Well, there isn't a disk format because the emulation literally works on a file by file basis. If you were to do a stat DSK on any of the drives that are available, you would literally see a drive that had a maximum number of records, that is an eight megabyte drive uh, with a maximum number of, with a maximum of 1,024 directory entries uh, with the absolute maximum of all values at all times, particularly because your average SD card size is much larger than eight megabytes. So you can put a lot of files without having to worry about disk capacities, planning out disk capacities, that sort of thing. The only thing you focus on is just putting the programs that you want to run into the appropriate folders for a drive and just using them. It works really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and just end the demonstration here. I think with this, you'll see that, especially once we get the edges kind of sanded off here, this is a wonderful way to run CPM on a number of different 8-bit uh, platforms, including the Apple II, uh, which especially the Apple II, uh, platforms like the Apple II and the Commodore 64, which historically, while they've had CPM support, uh, they've basically been hobbled by really, really, really obtuse disk formats, making it very difficult to move data onto and off of a particular CPM implementation. Well, the way we've done it here basically sidesteps all of that while maintaining CPM 2.2 compatibility at the application level. So with that, I'll go ahead and end it here. Um, more to come. Uh, I hope you guys, the, those of you who have pre-production FujiNets are enjoying it. I hope you guys take and update the hardware so that you can run this. Uh, so um, until next time, guys. Have fun.